you know, sometimes people mean, you know, God is big, which he is, of course, right? He's great, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, and all of the other attributes that we have big words to describe he is, you know? And, um, but the bottom line of it is, is, uh, is kind of the question of the idea that God can do anything. So I don't know if you've thought about that a lot. I mean, you know, certainly we would like to think the God who created the heavens and the earth can do anything, right? But the reality is, is that there are some things that God cannot do because he won't violate his word. I mean, he could do them. It isn't that he wouldn't have the ability to do them. It's the fact that he said something in his word that established a law or a principle or a a way of operation that he won't violate. And because of that, the reality is, is that God, there are some things that God cannot do. Now, I know that some people that hear that, they would think that I'm speaking blasphemy and would probably tell me that to my face and uh, whatever that is, it is, you know. I mean, if you don't like this, I guess you can refute it and just reject it and put it on the shelf or do whatever with it. But I, I invite you to study the scriptures and to search the scriptures to see if it's true. But let me just give this simple illustration. If God can do anything and could do everything, don't you think that the first thing he would do is make everybody get saved? Because the Bible clearly says it's God's will that none should perish, that all should come to repentance, right? Right. It says that it's his will that um, everybody should uh, come to the knowledge of the truth, should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, right? Okay? So, I mean, there's at least two scriptures that's, that show you clearly it's God's will for people to get saved. So, if salvation, and, and he's given us the job of preaching the gospel so people get saved, right? I mean, he's that's our commission. That's our job is to do what we did yesterday, go out in the streets, talk to people, engage them, encourage them to see in the word the truth that will set them free and then let the Holy Spirit work and, you know, they get what we call saved, you know, so they can go to heaven, so they can live their life for Jesus really is more important than right now is living their life for Jesus is more important than them going to heaven, right? Because if you don't live your life for Jesus, you can get sidetracked and never go to heaven, even though you once could have. Amen? Okay, some some people maybe would dispute that too because they say once saved, you're always saved and things like that. But that's another doctrine. I'm not going there. <laughs> I am not going there this morning. So, But the reality is, is that's what God would do because that's his heart. And that's why he sent Jesus to the cross. He would make every man, woman, young person everywhere in the world get saved. He'd just do it. And in fact, there are some people that believe that that's what he's done. They, they say that you're just saved. You just haven't found out about it yet. So, I mean, that's a whole other doctrine that I'm not going to go into this morning either. But, so there's this, there's this, this kind of tension, this kind of controversy about what God can do and what he can't do or if he's there's anything he can't do and so forth and so on. But there are other examples of things that God cannot or will not do because he's established it in his word. So the reality is he's given, he's given human, pe- human beings their own free will and they can choose to do or to not do. And he's maybe not fine with it, but he accepts their will and he doesn't override their will. So... There's this scripture in James 1, 12 that I want to kind of use and then come back to. I'm going to really have to go like really fast this morning to get all this in. I'm going to try. God blesses people, it says in James 1, 12, who patiently endure testing. Now, nobody likes testing. I don't like testing. But God, the Bible says that God blesses people who patiently endure testing Afterward, he says, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So there's a reward based on passing the test when you're tested, when you're tried. So have you been through some stuff? (laughs) Or are you going through some stuff right now? (laughs) So if so, maybe this message is for you this morning. Praise the Lord. Um, You know, maybe some people, you know, they think Jesus... Coming to Jesus is going to make all the problems go away. 
But my experience with people and my own personal experience has been coming to Jesus turned some things really upside down in life. And so if we tell people, you know, just come to Jesus, it'll be okay, everything will be fine, you know, we're not painting quite the right picture because there's adversity and there's trouble and there's situations and circumstances that are count, that will counter that. So anyway, let's turn to the book this morning and I want to take you quickly through the story of Jacob. Now this is, this is next to impossible to do in a few minutes, but I'm going to do my best. Because the, the story of Jacob, at least this portion of the story, spans eight chapters of Genesis. So it's pretty intense and pretty intensive. But what I want you to see is that Jacob had a destiny, and his destiny started at his birth. Well, maybe before his birth, it started really probably before his conception, because his daddy was this part of the seed of Abraham. So we, you know, we know that God is doing something there, and that he has a destiny because his his daddy's uh, father was Abraham, and God made promises to Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham and so forth. But anyway, in Genesis 25, and verse 21, it says, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. This is Rebekah he's speaking about. And the Lord granted his uh, prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. In other words, she had twins. She said... If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So when she went to acquire the Lord, the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples within you shall be divided, and one shall be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So Jacob happened to be the younger guy, and right there his destiny was sealed that he would be put over his older brother. Now, how many know that that's a recipe for family trouble, <laughs> for disaster, <laughs> especially in that culture where the oldest child got the blessing and the inheritance, the birthright inheritance plus the blessing. So we in Western world aren't so familiar with those customs, and that, so just take my word for it for right now because that's not the, the, the essence of the message. But the essence of the message is, is he had a destiny. His destiny was given to him at, in, in the womb, and his mom knew what the destiny was. So, anyway, it turned out that there was some, that he was, that the older brother was cheated, and, and Jacob was cheating. <laughs> so this is how it happened. It says that when that that when she gave birth, you know, after this period of time, that the one boy was red and hairy, and he came out, and they called him Esau because that had to do with being red and hairy. So today we call him, hey, Esau, or well, no, maybe we'd say Harry. Hi, Harry. But it said afterward, verse twenty-six, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. So in other words, Esau was being birthed. Jacob grabbed his heel, snuck around him, and came out first. No, actually the older brother came out first, but the other guy was hanging on to his heel. Okay? So now he's got a name. He's named Jacob, which means supplanter or um, schemer or... Deceitful. Yeah. So how would you like to be named? You know, you have a destiny and you come out and your mom says, good morning, deceitful. Welcome to the world. You've got a whole life ahead of you, but you're a deceiver. Wow. Okay. So, and in those days, names probably carried more weight than what we assigned to him. I know Christian people assign names to their kids, you know, with meaning and so forth and so on, because we ha we have some knowledge of these principles, right? But in that culture, you're, you're, you were your name and your name was you. <laughs> so Jacob begins to live up to his name, the schemer. Um, so it says in verse 29, once Jacob was cooking stew, and Esau came in from the field. He was exhausted, and Esau said to Jacob, Let me, let me have some of the red stew, for I'm exhausted. Um, therefore, it says his name was called Edom. 
Uh, it had to do with the stew and the exhaustion and the whatever, the red stew, I guess. And Jacob said, okay, just sell me your birthright. You hungry? You still hungry? Give me your birthright. Let's make a deal. And Esau said, I'm about to die. You know, that's about some of, like some of us that were fasting. We thought on, the, we thought on the second day we were about to die, but probably, probably he could have gone without another meal. Okay, maybe he'd gone out, gone, gone without some, you know, we don't know. He probably wasn't fasting and praying, but he, maybe he'd skipped a few. So Jacob said, swear to me now. So look, he's not just joking with his brother. He's saying, he's, he's making him take an oath, a vow that he will give his birthright to him. So he swore to him. He did it. <laughs> Amazing. He did it. He sold his birthright to Jacob. So in other words, he treated his birthright lightly. He didn't care so much, you know, like he's young, you know, I suppose. He's a kid, you know, who cares about that? I'm not 60 yet, you know. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentils and stew and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. So now it becomes a thing against God because he had the birthright because he was born first. Something that God gave every firstborn by the way he decreed things. So he's, you know, he would keep his word if that were the case. But now Esau has sold his birthright to his brother, the younger brother. So that's the first step to him, to the, to the younger ruling over the older. Okay. So, Destiny is then challenged. In, ver in chapter 27 of Genesis, we're, we're skipping a lot. It would be really good for you to read this whole thing because it's an amazing story. In Genesis chapter 27, it says, the first verse, When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so he couldn't see, he called Esau, Esau his older son, and said, Son, and he said, Here am I. He said, Behold, I don't know the day of my death. Now take your, women, uh, your weapons and your quiver, and he, he said, go out hunting and bring me back some food. Because he particularly liked the food that Esau made. And it turns out that Esau was kind of his favorite son, but Jacob was mom's favorite son. How many know that's a recipe for disaster? Okay, so you see what's kind of going on here. Now, remember, remember when you're thinking about all of these things, these are people that they have a covenant through Abraham and Isaac, their dad. So these are God's special people. And, you know, they're the ones that are supposed to bring in the seed that crushes the head of the enemy, right? Because that's God's promise to Adam and Eve in the garden. And then through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the seed should come, right? So these are really special people. These are people set aside by God for a special purpose and a special destiny. And you see all of this going on in their family. So everybody say, they weren't perfect. They weren't perfect. So guess what that means for you and me? <laughs> yeah, maybe we get a chance, amen? <laughs> like praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> so... Anyway, he tells his son to go out and get some food. And uh, verse 5 said, Rebecca was listening when he spoke this. And she's thinking, you know what? This is not a good thing because he's about to give his blessing. When, when, when Esau comes back, he's going to give the birthright blessing and, and he's going to give the blessing to, to Esau. Now, this is the, the birthright and the blessing are two different things. The blessing was what a, a departing father spoke over his children, and he spoke, it over, spoke blessings over all of them, but one person got the special blessing, and she knew that was coming to Esau, okay? So, verse 8, she says to, to Jacob, Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. A little bit of a controlling mom here, maybe? Yikes. Go to the flock and bring me two good goats so that I can prepare them a delicious food for your father such as he loves. Now look, she's, she's helping the deceiver be deceptive. Verse 10. And you shall bring it to your father to eat unless he, and, and, and that, so that he may bless you before he dies. So she knows what's up, right? 
And uh, but Jacob said to his to Rebecca, his mother, "Behold, my, uh, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing." So I mean, he's not totally. He's not just saying, "Okay, mom, whatever you say." <laughs> You know, it's all right. We can, we can, we can do this little trick on dad. You know, it'll be okay. It's cool. But he's, he's aware that he's, he's playing with dynamite here. And that he, if he missteps, he, he'll be on the, not the nice, not the nice end, not the good end. He could get a curse out of this. And, um, then his, his mother said to him, let your, listen to this. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. And only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So she's taken the curse for him for doing this. And if you read the Bible, it didn't go very well for her. So this guy's becoming a master of deception with mom's help. So Jacob went to hear and went near to his Isaac, his father, and felt him, uh, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. I mean, he must have been really blind. Blinder than a bat. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau hands. So he blessed him and he said, are you really my son Esau? So he still has some second thoughts and he answered, I am. He lied to him. Verse 25, he says, bring it, uh, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game. So he brought it and he ate and he drank and so forth and so on. And then verse 25, listen to this blessing that he gave to, Isaac, uh, the, to um, Jacob. Then his father said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled of the garments and he blessed him. So what they did to deceive him is they also... They dressed him in Esau's clothes so that he smelled like Esau. He felt like Esau. He just sounded like Jacob. Wow. What a scheme. So then he said, see the smell of my son is the smell as of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of earth and the plenty of grain and wine. Let the people serve you and the nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. Be Lord over your brothers. Be Lord over your brothers. See what's happening here? And may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. And blessed be everyone who blesses you. See, he's passing on the blessing that he got from Abraham to his son, Jacob, by mistake by deception, by being deceived. What was the result of that? Well, look at verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And, Jacob, and, and Esau said to himself, the days of mourning of my father are approaching and then I will kill my brother Jacob. So look what a mess all of this caused in the family just because they didn't do it the right way. They didn't let God be God. But here's the good news. You know, when we really, really mess up, God has a redemptive plan. Thankfully, on this side of the cross, we know what that plan is. And we can access that plan by coming to Jesus through faith in him, by putting our faith in Jesus like we'd put our faith in a parachute when we jump out of the plane. By trusting in him, trusting in his word, believing that God raised him from the dead, confessing his lordship, we have a redemptive plan. God has a redemptive plan for us. But look at verse 12 of Genesis 28. It said that Jacob had run away now from this situation because his brother was going to kill him. And verse 12 says, he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God were descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. And uh, the land which on, you, on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall, you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. 
and in you shall the offspring of the families of the earth be blessed. Now, doesn't that sound similar to the blessing he spoke to Abraham, the, the, the covenant that he spoke over Abraham? It is, because it is the covenant. He passed the covenant on, and God confirmed it now in this dream, speaking to him on this dream. And he said, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. That's pretty big. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Isn't that an awesome promise? Verse 16, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Verse 20, Then Jacob made a vow and said, If God be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me the bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. So the place was called Bethel. Bethel is, means house of God. And all that you give me, of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So just think about what's happening here. Jacob is saying, God, thank you for making that covenant with me. And I vow to you that as you keep your end of the covenant, I'll keep my vow to you and I'll give you the tenth. I'll give you the tithe. Basically, he's saying, I'm going to tithe to you. You see how powerful that is? Jacob was a deceiver. Jacob got this the wrong way. Jacob didn't deserve any of this. But Jacob got a covenant because his father passed it on to him and didn't take it back. Couldn't take it back. Because when Esau wanted to get some kind of blessing, he gave him a blessing, but he said, I can't give you that one. Sorry. You just missed out. Your mom and your brother, they they, they tricked us. Now, that's big family problems. But God had to sort out the family problems. Amen? Okay, so what happened to Jacob? Well, he's still a schemer, right? He hasn't changed any. He just got a... A promise and a blessing and a, uh, he had the birthright and he had the blessing from his dad and he had the covenant from God. But he's still a deceiver. So he goes around just being like he was before, right? So anyway, he goes to his uh, relative's house and he finds his two, you know, marries these two ladies. Um, he marries his two ladies, his two, two sisters. Actually, he wanted one sister. And the, his uncle deceived him and gave him the other sister. He wanted Rachel, he got Leah for working for seven years. And then the, the, the father, the uncle, says, hey, you can have the other one too, you can have Rachel too, but it's another seven years. So guess what's happening to Jacob? The stuff that he's sowing as being a deceiver is coming back to him in a harvest. But the good thing is, is he still has the covenant of God. And he still has the blessing of God on his life. So, verse 43 of Genesis 30 said, Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants, male servants, camels, and donkeys. Well, in between those places, you read about how God blessed and prospered Jacob in the house of his uncle. Even though his uncle changed his wages and did all kinds of stuff to him, he still blessed him and prospered him, and he kept growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so now it's about time for all of the chickens to come home to roost, right? Because Jacob has sown all this bad seed, and now it's harvest time. So in Genesis chapter 31... It says that Jacob heard that the sons, this is in verse 1, Jacob heard the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's and from what was our father's has gained on, he has gained all this wealth. So his wife's brothers are saying this stuff about him. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. I mean, before before Laban liked him because he was making him to prosper. I mean, he was working hard and Everybody was rich. 
But now he's not looking on him with favor anymore. So the Lord said to Jacob, verse 3, Return to the land of your fathers and your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob told his wives about these these things. You know, his father doesn't like me, father, dad doesn't like me anymore, and brothers are against me. And you know, the Lord spoke to me and said we should go. Verse 6 says, you know that I've served your father with all my strength. Verse 7, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. So even though his chickens are coming to roost, he's getting back what he deserved and what's what's coming back from his seed. God is still overriding it and making it making him blessed even though all this bad stuff is happening to him. Verse 25. Laban over to, uh, it says that bef- between there and verse 25 it says that they left they they left with everything they had. They just left J- uh, Laban's house. Verse 25 says then Laban began to chase him and uh, finally found him. Verse 26 says Laban said to Jacob, "What have you done?" that you have tricked me. <laughs> you see, Jacob is still the trickster. He's still the schemer. What have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so I couldn't talk to my kids, my grandkids? You know, you some kind of crazy man? <laughs> then verse 29, he says, It is in my power to do you harm, But the God of your father spoke to me last night and said, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. (laughs) So God is warning him, don't touch him. He's my boy. All because of this covenant. You see, God will keep covenant because he said, when I make a covenant, I don't break them. I'm not a man that I should repent. I'm not a man that I should lie. I'm not a son of man that I should, should repent. So he's keeping his covenant in spite of the fact that Jacob's still a schemer. He's still a cheater. He's still deceitful. So Genesis 32 says, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. Think about that. God sent his angels to meet Jacob when he was on his way. And when Jacob saw him, he said, this is God's camp. So then... Jacob sends out a team to go find out where his brother is because he's thinking about his brother. You know, my brother wanted to kill me when I went. He might want to kill me when I come back. (laughs) Now he's thinking about, you know, I left here and I'm going there. That might be worse than leaving here. So he sent these messengers out. Verse 6 says the messengers returned and said, We came to your brother Esau. He's coming to meet you and there are 400 men with him. That's not a good sign. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people and the flocks and so forth into camps. And he's thinking if he comes to one camp, the other one can escape. So he's still, he's the schemer, right? He's the guy that's got everything figured out. He's going to, he's going to make it somehow. At least half of us will get there, you know. But then came time for repentance. And Jacob began to pray. Now he's coming to God. He's between the rock and the hard place. Doesn't look good about his brother. And verse 9, he begins to pray. He says, God of father of my Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and your kindred that I may do good to you. I'm not worthy of the least of all the deeds of the steadfast love and the faithfulness that you've shown to your servant for only my staff, uh, with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan and now I've, I've become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother Esau for I fear him that he could come and attack me, the mothers and the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered. So what's he saying to God? He's repeating the covenant back to God and saying, you made a covenant with me. Amen. And I made a covenant with you. You have to keep your covenant. Did you know that you could hold God to his covenant? Because he's still a covenant keeping God. And he's got a covenant for you. And he's got a covenant for your family. So all of the things that really, really look bad for you, God's bigger than those things. Verse 22, it starts to talk about that night that he arose and he took his wives and they sent them across the stream and so forth. Verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone. 
And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip socket was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said, what is your name? And he said, Jacob, deceiver, supplanter, schemer. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, which means God strives. For you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. So it's kind of a backhanded compliment in a sort of way. (laughs) But he's recognizing and confirming the covenant again. Evidently, Jacob knew this was more than just a man that he was fighting with. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it you ask my name? And he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, which means the face of God, saying, for I've seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. (laughs) Wow. And the sun rose upon him, and he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. So that night, with that prayer, and with that wrestling with God, Jacob came to himself. That was the night of repentance for him. That was the night of God changing everything and giving him a new name. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. God has a new name for you. It's no longer sinner. It's saved. It's saint. It's the righteousness of God in Christ and all the other names that come to a believer. So, God made him that night into man of character and integrity. God can change a person's heart and affect their character and affect their integrity. God can really change you. So, if you've been going through some stuff and pressing through some stuff or maybe going through it now, God is bigger than your thing. That you're faced, your trial, your trouble, your tribulation, your temptation. God can really change you. So let's take a look at the new man of Israel, the new man called Israel. Genesis 33. It says that he looked up and he saw that Esau was coming. So now this is this is like this is the test of the covenant. This is D-Day. Verse four says, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him. And fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. (laughs) So all it took was a day of repentance. Prayer to God. Renewing the covenant. Reminding God of his covenant. And prevailing with God. And everything changed. The stone cold heart of his brother was turned the other way. And they kissed and wept. Verse 8 says, Esau said, What do you mean with all this company that I met? In other words, the, the gifts and things that Jacob had sent ahead. Jacob said, To find favor in your sight, my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No, please, if I found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I've seen your face, which was like seeing the face of God. And you have accepted me. I mean, now these are two brothers that did never get along. Never. Because one was dad's favorite. One was mom's favorite. They never shelled the twain meat. But look what God did. Reconciliation. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. And thus he urged him and he took it. Yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some cultural things going on there. But the point is, is God is a big God. And he's a God of redemption and reconciliation and your thing isn't too big for him. All right, so I kind of want to land the plane. I was reading the, 
the um, devotional Pastor Larry Stockstill, one of my mentors, and um, I came across this one from the book of James that he takes it out of. Uh, and maybe this story that I just read to you, or just talked to you about, talked you through, maybe it leaves you with more questions than answers because there's some stuff going on in there that, you know, it's a little hard to wrap your mind around because, you know, how can God bless this stuff? You know, how can he bless him in spite of all this stuff? And yet when you think about it, you know, the grace of God is so much bigger than what we can understand. We, you know, I can't understand why he blessed me or why he's blessing me. Totally. I mean, I, I, I intellectually can conceive, you know, I know what the Bible says about salvation, what that brings to you and so forth. But to really wrap your heart around that, I mean, God is that big. I mean, he's got that big a heart. He really, he really loves me that much. <laughs> he really cares about me that much that he'll do that for me. He'll do for me what he did for Jacob. He'll do for me what he did for others in the Bible. Will he really? You know, because we've got this thing about favorites. I mean, we understand the thing about the mom loving one and the dad loving the other and, you know, favorites in families. And maybe you've experienced that in your family. I don't know. I might, so I'm, so maybe that was going on. You, you, you get a grasp of that. Or at least you see it in somebody's life. And, wow, this, what about God? But he's got this huge heart. He's love. Love that we can't even comprehend. So... Remember the scripture that we started with? It said, God bless the people who patiently endure testing from James 1.12. Afterward, they will receive a crown that God has promised to those who love him. Isn't that kind of like the story of Jacob? I mean, yeah, a lot of that stuff was his own doing, but he was going through some stuff. For years, he was going through some stuff. So maybe you've got a long-standing kind of deal that's been going on and on and on and on. And it seems like there's no end to this thing ending. But I want you to know this God, the same God that helped Abraham, that helped Isaac, that blessed Jacob in spite of all of his craziness, in spite of all of his deceitfulness, conniving, scheming. He loves you every bit as much as that. And he'll keep covenant with you Every bit as much of that because Jesus went to the cross and sealed that covenant with his own blood. I mean, we were bought with a price. It's amazing. Praise the Lord. So, I don't know. Maybe you're going through a severe trial today. But if so, you need to settle certain issues about that. And the first thing is, is that your reaction to the trial should be one of joy. Because the testing of your faith, it says in James 2, 1, 2, and 3, it says the testing of your faith develops perseverance or endurance. You know, one thing that Jacob had, he, was, he had endurance. <laughs> I mean, he pressed through right to the end of pinning that angel to the ground or pinning God to the ground. I mean, he said, I saw God face to face, and I, I lived to tell about it. This is a miracle. I should have died. I mean, what if you were wrestling with God? So James says, in the middle of the trouble, throw a party. What? Who throws parties in the middle of trouble? You know, Pastor Karen and I, we've gone through a few things, a time or two. But when we were very young in the Lord, we were going through a really, really bad trial. We were down to nothing. And they were going to come and auction our house because we couldn't pay the mortgage. Because some stuff had happened I can't go into. And somebody ministered this. I think it was Jerry Seville. We were at a Jerry Seville meeting and they ministered this. And he was talking about trials and he was talking from this scripture and he said, you know, that means when you're in the middle of your worst trouble, just throw a party. Show the devil that he doesn't have the upper hand, that God's bigger than he is, and just celebrate. Throw a party. So we're going through this, and we decided to throw a party. So we called some friends, neighbors, and said, we're having a party. So we got balloons and decorations and whatever, and our kids, you know, were little, you know, they were just toddlers. And they were having a great time with it. And 
Nobody showed up. <laughs> but we had to party anyway. And I want you to know, the day before the deadline to set the, mor- the, the, the sheriff's sale in place, the money came in. And we redeemed our house. <laughs> so we learned a big lesson about when you're in trouble, when there's a trial. And we've never forgotten it. I mean, I hadn't thought about it for a while, but God is good. <laughs> He's awesome. So rejoice when trials come your way. Because without a test, there can be no testimony. Do you ever think about that? The people in the Bible have a testimony because they got tested. They had a problem. They had big trouble. Great people of faith. Number two. So, I mean, the first thing is you should, your reaction should be one of joy, not sadness. Because James says, throw a party. Number two, you should remember that if you persevere and withstand the test, you'll receive the crown of life. That's from verse 12 of James 1. If you persevere you'll with, and withstand the test, you'll receive the crown. So there's a reward for persevering through a trouble, through trials and through situations. You see that with that story of Jacob. It's, it's a huge, huge redemptive story. Number three is, you should never blame God for your trials. Because he doesn't tempt you. He's not tempting you into sin. And you know, the reality is, he only gives what's good. Because look at verse 17, James chapter 1. Whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God above, who created all heaven's lights. Wow. God is good. And he gives good and perfect gifts, some of the translations say. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father of lights in heaven. Amen? Praise the Lord. Always remember how kind the Lord is, how good he is, so merciful. This God of ours is merciful. Psalm 116, verse 5. So we're going to break here for a few minutes and let you talk.